once more now, we're going to look at verses 17, especially the second half of 17 and 18. And this time, the question we're going to ask is, uh, what difference does it make to notice that we have Old Testament allusion, allusions, and, and an Old Testament quote. I mean, you could you could read this straight through, interpret it, and and not even recognize that, and you might get it all right, because I think the author gives plenty of clues in his immediate context to how he wants the words to be taken. But they are, if they are there, if, if he's alluding to something in the Old Testament, and if he's quoting the Old Testament, that's probably going to be useful to notice. And so let's go back. That's the method we want to use is to go back and look at those and see what they, what light they shed. Father, we love it that you have ordained for there to be an Old Testament and a New Testament, and that the New Testament writers love the Old Testament and cite it often and allude to it even more often. So teach us now what we can learn about our own suffering as a Christian and how to glorify God in it by the way Peter uses the Old Testament. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God by that name because, and then all of this is is an argument for how you can glorify God or why you should glorify God, not be ashamed in this suffering here. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, so there you have judgment beginning with us. Now that's an allusion probably to the Old Testament. Let me finish reading. What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And, and then you see the quotes here. This is a direct quote from Proverbs eleven thirty one, And this is an allusion probably to Ezekiel 9, 6 through... Hmm, can't remember how far it goes. We'll look at it in just a minute. Four through six. Yeah. Four through six. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So let's look at the illusion. So here we are. He's saying that judgment is beginning at the household of God. Here's Ezekiel 9 in this terrible prediction of destructive judgment coming upon Jerusalem with its slaughter of so many people. The Lord said to him, this man ready to mark the, the righteous, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed in it. So those would be the righteous, the people who hate evil and are brokenhearted because of the sins, because of the sins of Jerusalem and to the others that is those who are about to do the judgment to the others he said in my hearing pass through the city after him and strike your eyes shall not spare and you shall show no pity kill old men outright young men maidens little children women but touch no one on whom the mark is and begin at my sanctuary that's probably what Peter has in mind. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders. So any elders who don't have the mark, they're going to be under judgment. So there's a division. And Peter has in mind, it seems, this beginning with the sanctuary or the house of God and even the elders. Here's another one in Jeremiah 25, 29. For behold, I begin... I begin to work disaster at the city called by my name. I begin to work disaster and judgment at the city called by my name. And, and shall you, the rest of you, go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth. So it seems that in both Ezekiel and here in Jeremiah, we have a, a picture of judgment in a big historical, even, I think, end time, all the inhabitants of the earth. 
So judgment at the end begins, the disaster begins at the city of God or at the people, the house, the sanctuary of God. So here is Peter picking up that language. If if the judgment that begins with the household of God, that is, that we're experiencing right now as Christians, if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of the rest of the, the nations, the rest of the people that don't obey God? So he wants us, the, the least we could say is that this part right here is intended to be felt by those who know the Old Testament as a big end time focus, right? A, a judgment that is historical, it's on it's global, it's on all the peoples of the world beginning with God's own people. Now here he quotes a proverb, which is just so different, so different. Proverbs eleven thirty thirty one. If the righteous is repaid on earth, or if the righteous in the earth is repaid, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Now that in context, is simply proverbial wisdom. It's the sort of thing that you see all the time in the world. Righteous people experience repayment. Now, this might be punishment or discipline, and it might be positive, but Peter takes it as as discipline, it seems. The righteous is repaid. How much more the wicked and the sinner? And which that might mean how much more are they repaid on the earth, or it just might mean how much, if the righteous on the earth are repaid, how much more will the will the sinners be repaid? So I think the idea is that here we are to see end time implications and judgments, and here Peter sees the same truth expressed in a a proverb. This is proverbial. So what are we to then do with all of that? Well, maybe we could sum it up like this. In end time judgment, global judgment, and in proverbial daily wisdom or life, God saves his people through suffering. And therefore, if you are one of these sufferers as a Christian, whether you're thinking of it in terms of just daily ordinary experience or whether you're thinking of it in terms of big end time judgment, both are in Peter's view. And the point is that whether it's experienced one way or the other, it is God saving his people through suffering. And therefore, it is so much a part of God's total plan for daily proverbial experience of his people and end time judgment of his people. You shouldn't feel singled out, but rather should glorify God. Glorify God. If anyone suffers as a Christian, in view of the end time or in view of the ordinary daily experience of Christians, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name.